Fortified wines have a very special place in the history of Australia. In fact, many of the original wine styles were modelled on the famous ports and sherries of Europe. In this episode, we look at the rich and complex tawnies and the magnificent muscats. So join me as we take in a slice of Australian history and heritage. James Godfrey's been the winemaker at Sepult's Field for the last 30 years or so. James, what an extraordinary place. You probably feel more like a custodian than you do a winemaker. Oh, absolutely. When you walk into um, a place like this that has over 100 years of history, you, you soon realise that you're only a very small snapshot of, of the total place and, and you are a custodian of, of all the wines that are here. It's an absolutely extraordinary place because you're making all manner of fortified styles of wine here. Yeah, it's unique in the world in that Australia's got the capability of making all these fantastic wines across all the styles from, you know, the pale, delicate sort of sherry styles, even though we can't use that name anymore, but um, through tawny styles, through muskets and tokay styles. So we cover the whole gambit, which is fantastic. What about a little snapshot of the history of fortified wine production in Australia? Because it really goes back to the early days, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and I guess in the very early days, wine had to be uh, consistent and easy to drink. So fortifieds were the great way of going. They, they were very consistent, they were reliable in terms of the consumer could buy something and, and be very happy with it. They transported well, and we didn't have the technology to make all the, all the fantastic sort of table wines that we're doing today. So that was, that was the forerunner to, to where we are now. Yeah, it's funny because I don't think people realise that Australia's got that long history of fortified production, and that means we're very, very good at it. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the history of fortifieds up until about the 1940s, 85 to 90% of the industry was fortifieds. So it, it is a very important part of our industry and history. It's really the tawnies though that are the backbone of what you do here, isn't it? Yeah, tawny ports have been um, sort of the biggest part of the industry, the fortified industry for a long time and it's, it's somewhere around 80 to 90% of the industry currently. So it's what we concentrate on and I think it's what we do best. So James, we're in Joseph's room. What did Joseph do in this room? <laughs> Well, this is where Joseph started the beginnings of Sepplesfield as we know it today. So this particular room is under the dairy, and the dairy was his original winery, so he took over his wife's dairy. And uh, after many years of, of building up the business, it became obvious that the dairy was no longer big enough. So his wife said he either had to build a new dairy or build a winery, so he decided to build a new winery for himself and relinquish the dairy back to his wife but he still kept this room as where he did all his beginnings and all his blends. But there's also some tonics and things that you can see, historic tonic bottles and things. That must have been part of the, the process. Yeah, in the early days they did a lot of tonic wines. So um, they did cordials for a start. They did um, things like a Sedna blend, which was a tonic wine, which would cure just about anything known to mankind. <laughs> um, they did bitters and a lot of those sort of products. So that was part of the early, early days. What's your favourite sort of food pairing with Tawny Port? Um, I'm actually fortunate. I've done about 70 fortified dinners, which is go to way with fortifieds from every course. And uh, I think one of the greatest combinations I've had is vintage port style with um, braised beef cheeks. Wow. So and just a little bit of um, grilled pork belly sitting on top. So it's really incredibly intense. So you don't need a lot of food, but they're fantastic. Um, 
with fortifiers. Yeah, and that's, most people think that it's you know dessert or possibly cheese, but I think the the range that will uh, a sweet wine like a fortified uh, uh, tawny would do, that kind of cover a lot of bases actually. Yeah, and I, I think it's food with flavour, and you don't need a lot of food. It's but got to be you, rich though. But you have it rich and intense, and and those sort of those sort of foods will actually dominate most table wines. So fortifieds have the power and ability to to combine really well with them. So oh, that's nice. what we do. Cool. Now you've also, if I'm not mistaken, you've got an unbroken collection of vintage dated tawny, tawnies heading back to 18, what is 78. it? 78. So yeah, one of, the, one of the great things about this site is that we have an unbroken collection of fortifieds, single vintages from 1878. It's the only winery in the world that has this unbroken collection. And um, it, it's actually a very good educational tool. It's also fantastic as sort of a living museum of the Australian wine industry, covering all those, all those vintages. Well, I'm not so curious about tasting tonics, but I'm really curious about tawny, so what do you reckon? I reckon we'd better go and do it. Wine and food pairing. In the past there were rules, and I'm not a real fan of rules, but they were based on a fairly solid foundation. Red meat with red wine, white meat with white wines. But wine was different then, food was different then. Now we're faced with all sorts of cross-cultural influence in cuisine and correspondingly different wine styles from around the world. So where do you start? What constitutes a great wine and food match? Basically, the wine should taste great on its own, the dish should be well seasoned and carefully prepared, but when you try them together, something magical happens. The flavours of the dish are enhanced and the qualities of the wine seem to just jump out of the glass. However, I maintain, be a bit of an anarchist, break the rules, get out there and experiment. You might just find a few surprises. James, this is extraordinary. So uh, right here's your 1909. That's what you're going to be bottling this year. Absolutely. Year. Well, yes. In May. In we, May. We, okay. we bottle and release part of this wine in May. And so what are we about to taste here? We're tasting the 1908 then. Yes. That's the current Which release. Which is our if you current like. release wine. And this is the balance that we have left of, of all the wine that we've released. So start off with this size barrel and we end up in this size barrel at the minute. Oh, it's like syrup. It is. It's a uh, living history in a glass. Look at that. That's absolutely extraordinary. Look at this. Oh. It's almost picked up a bit of a savouriness or something. I mean, it's... It has all these burnt toffees, yeah. caramel characters. It has um, nutty characters. It's incredibly intense and viscous. Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, and somebody once described this as essence of wine, actually. It's probably not a bad description because I don't think I've ever had anything quite mm. like this. So what we have is we have 2,000 litres of wine packed into a little barrel like this at the end, which is a 500 litre barrel. So we've got all that 2,000 litres of flavour packed into a 500 litre flavour. And that's bit of essentially because of, of evaporation, evaporation and concentration. Yeah. It's fruit from the Barossa, vintaged in the old gravity-fed cellar, from spirit from the distillery, aged in these barrels in this cellar for 100 years, all the same. So the only difference is actually vintage variation. So they have these subtle vintage variations, but with this level of concentration, the wines just look pretty much the same sort of style year in, year out. And it is the best wine from the vintage. Quite some vision back in 1878 to say, hey, we're gonna lay one barrel down and you're not allowed to have it for 100 years. Absolutely, it takes a lot of willpower to do that. <laughs> no kidding. And the beauty is we've had no wars, we've had no civil unrest to to upset that whole continuity. Thinking about what I would have with this, but I think this is just it, huh? You're not gonna have anything. No, this is on its own. This yeah. is an experience on its own. You, you only need a few mils, as you can see, and um, it just, it gives you a, so many different descriptors that you want to put on it. And it, it's, it's sort of all the experiences you get out of Tawny in one, in one little glass form. Yeah, thinking grapes 100 years ago, being trodden and 
impressed and here we are drinking the results of it. I wish I knew someone in that birth year. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard. Well, my grandmother actually was born in 1907 and is still alive, so she's 102 now. So there you go. <laughs> is she in better shape than the wine? Or Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>
that's the pinnacle of our, the top of the range. We would expect always to be in excess of 20 years old, the average age. It just lingers in your mouth for so long. We call the Grand and the Rare our sipping wines and the uh, Rutherglen and the Classic our drinking wines. That's remarkable stuff. I mean, it's got incredible richness, but these layers and layers of, of uh, complexity, and to my mind, sweetness doesn't equal greatness, it's complexity that does, and that, that, that absolutely yeah, fits the bill. I think it's fantastic. What, what I love about all these wines is there's all that complexity and that richness from the older wines in there, but there's this beautiful sort of vibrancy that comes through. Yeah, and that's where the Solera system is helpful, because we get a gradual trickle down yep. of the youth coming in with the age, and we always have a saying that uh, the blend of the exuberance of youth and the wisdom of age and get the two right, and that's where it's a, a real art in blending the wines to make sure you get that recipe right so that you, we end up with the product that we want. Here's to the wisdom of uh, age and the exuberance of youth. Malcolm, Rutherglen Muscat is such a unique style of wine, there's like really nothing like it anywhere else in the world. So what is it about the area? What is it about the sort of the feel for the place here that uh, makes it so special for Muscat? Um, a number of things, Mark. Firstly, we've, we've selected our vines over a number of generations now that we produce this uh, rich, balanced juice. Uh, we have to have a balance between fruit flavour and sugar. One without the other, you don't get the result that, that we need. Right. So we do that. We have a long, dry, normally a long, dry, warm summer without being too hot. Uh, and then through the autumn, the vines can just hang on until they get good and ripe without shriveling too much. You're getting that this year balance. we've got a bit of shrivel because yep. we've had it pretty hot this summer. Uh, but that combined with then when you get into the older stocks of wine for blending, uh, the blending processes, it just becomes a heritage thing. Yeah. and. Uh, We've just been doing it for that long with the, that combined with our soil, a red loam soil. Uh, it all just seems to, the mus musket loves it and it comes together. How long have vines been grown here? Uh, we don't know for sure how long musket's been here, but we know we've had stocks in the place for, for around about the 100 year mark. And uh, so it's been here a long time. Nothing wrong with that sort of heritage in the no, vineyard, is there? No, we don't mind it at all. famous Rutherglen Muscat is the Toke, and that's made from the Muscadel grape right here and we've caught Morris's on the right day, they're just harvesting, so let's have a look. It's like a, a museum of fantastic old equipment here. I mean, look at, the, look at this cask here. How old is this cask? Well, that cask there is over 100 year old. You can faintly see on it P.O. Sullivan, maker, Barnawatha. Well, that uh, Cooper went broke over 100 years ago. 
but so that's over 100 years. Over 100 years old, that's right. And uh, it's a great cast, good thick wood on it and everything else like and that. And still you... usable. Oh, very much so. It's ideal for um, fortified uh, right. the storage and that. Yeah, as you can see, that's got a tokay in it and right. uh, been there for a fair while, aging away gracefully. Okay, so that's a 100 year old cask. What's the oldest wine you've got, the actual wine sitting in the cask? Uh, we have actually got some wines that, are, that go back um, pre phylloxera as well, which is the turn of the 19th century, so that'll be a bit over 100 years age. Can we uh, try that? Uh, yeah, righto, then I'll give you, not, give you a little look at it. Not yeah. here for a haircut. <laughs> Mark, this is the old wine. Hang on to that. Oh, well. and, uh, That's exciting. Yes, it's very heavy, so I'll have to pipette it up because it just won't run into the valence. No, with the viscosity, it's hard going. Oh, look at this stuff. And so what is this? Uh, this is wine that's um, more than 100 year old. This is... Uh, it's like syrup. It's fantastic. Very much so. You, you can see the colour in there, just that uh, golden syrup, uh, very uh, khaki colours to the uh, to the age of the wine. Yeah, that's all I'll share with you. Oh, that's, yeah. uh, you know what, that's more than enough, <laughs> I reckon. Look at this. Uh, have, have a look at that. Absolutely magnificent. Look at this. A hundred-year-old musket. Yeah, there's not many of them around. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's magnificent. Yeah, the colour of it. See how it hangs to the glass. <sighs> That's extraordinary. It's so thick, so viscose, so complex, it's unbelievable. And what do you say? It's just absolutely magnificent. Well, it's a very interesting wine by itself, but you can imagine what it can do to a blend for us. And uh, so we don't use that as an individual no. wine, but as a blending component, the richness, the concentration, how it can uh, impact on a final blend, it's, uh, it's incredible. So you get a little bit of young wine in, in amongst this, you know, lift it up a little bit and then just using that. That's right, even though that has got a very good clean fruit character to it, but um, younger musket will actually impart a little bit more of that rose petal floral. Right. Yeah. Liquid gold, Australian history in a glass. Absolutely fantastic. Young or old, the producers of Australia's fortified wines view themselves as custodians of a piece of Australian history. We should be so thankful to them. That it's not trendy right now to drink these wines is a crying shame. Complex, nutty tawnies and rich, magnificent muscats are true Australian treasures. And don't just think sweet, think savoury too. So you need to sit up and pay attention to Australia's liquid gold.